Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio leads a procession and mass for Catholics showing up by the busloads to support Mother Cabrini. The patroness of immigrants won a citywide poll but was snubbed. I'm Tim Harfman and I'll have the story. Big news from the Vatican. Pope Francis opens a major summit on the Amazon. Church leaders are tackling hot topics including married priests and new roles for women. After getting their red hats, 13 new cardinals and the Holy Father pay a visit to Benedict XVI. Plus, the U.S. Supreme Court begins a new term. Cases important to Catholics are on the docket. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Emily Druby. Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio and Catholics in the diocese are on the march for Mother Cabrini. A large crowd out in force to push back against a city hall snub of the beloved saint. Currents News' Tim Harfman reports that story from Carroll Gardens. Catholics arriving to Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn by the busloads, rallying behind St. Francis Xavier Cabrini amid controversy. Mother Cabrini was snubbed by the city after receiving the most votes in an online poll. I think it's a disgrace that a person so great, it's not being recognized. Yeah, she did so much. Ave Maria, piena di gracia. Catholics are outraged after the city's first lady, Charlene McRae, ignored the results of her She Built NYC campaign, a plan to erect statues honoring exceptional women who built the Big Apple. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio leading about a thousand Catholics during Sunday's procession with a strong message for the city. They should reconsider since Mother Cabrini received uh, many votes, more votes than anybody else, and they asked for input. Uh, why ignore it? Nearly 350 women were nominated. Mother Cabrini overwhelmingly received the top spot with 219 votes. She was a woman of courage and, and bucked a lot of systems to do what she had to do. We think that she certainly deserves to have a statue here. If we're doing other women, we should have her too. Mother Cabrini is the patroness of immigrants and arrived in New York from Italy in 1889. She opened schools, a hospital, orphanages and other social service programs throughout the United States. In Brooklyn, Mother Cabrini founded the now shuttered school at Sacred Hearts St. Stephen Church, the first Italian Catholic parish in the diocese. John Heyer is the archivist there and says the 20th century saint made significant contributions across the country. She constantly moved. She's a perfect symbol for the new evangelization, for going out, doing things, bringing our faith, bringing Christ and his love out into the public arena and to people who need it. And that's really why we're here today. Catholics processed to the Brooklyn Church from nearby Mother Cabrini Park. To be able to actually walk in the footsteps where she ministered is really exciting. We've had crowds, but we've never had a crowd like this. And it really shows what it means, what it means to people, that whole symbolism of Mother Cabrini and the church. Following the procession, Bishop DiMarzio celebrated mass in Italian and English. Only five of the current 150 city-erected statues are dedicated to women. Bishop DiMarzio is spearheading a campaign to put up a statue of Mother Cabrini in Brooklyn. In Carroll Gardens, Tim Harfman, Currents News. Bishop DiMarzio is encouraging Catholics in the diocese to voluntarily pitch in to build the new Cabrini statue. Contributions are being accepted at the Catholic Foundation for Brooklyn and Queens at cfbq.org slash Cabrini statue. A long line of Catholic clergy, Pope Francis and hundreds of indigenous people kicking off a major church summit. It's our other big story tonight. The highly anticipated Synod of Bishops for the Amazon is underway. The Holy Father sitting front and center at the head of the table, telling nearly 300 participants that the Holy Spirit is the main actor at the summit. Melissa Butts is standing by in Rome with the very latest. Melissa? Yes, in fact, today the beginning of the Synod on the Amazon happened inside the Vatican in a very special place in St. Peter's Basilica.
Right above St. Peter's tomb, nets, canoes, and faces of Amazonian martyrs were present at the prayer, which opened the meeting on the Amazon. All participants then processed to the Synod Hall, where Pope Francis opened the session. He recalled the Synod's purpose and addressed a controversial working document. Se elaboró el instrumentos un labor, instrumento un labor, que como saben es un texto mártir, destinado a ser destruido. ¿no? Porque de ahí es como el punto de partida para lo que el Espíritu va a hacer en nosotros. He asked for respect for indigenous traditions and mentioned his disappointment from the Synod opening mass the day before. Someone had commented sarcastically on the headdress of one of the indigenous people who had brought up the offertory gifts. Decime, ¿qué diferencia hay entre llevar plumas en la cabeza y el tricornio que usan algunos oficiales de nuestro dicasterio? A bird's eye view of the opening mass revealed these differences in traditions. It was here to both bishops and indigenous leaders that Pope Francis asked for fire. He was not referring to the fires that destroyed the Amazon this past summer, but that of the Holy Spirit. Egli che fa nuove tutte le cose ci doni la sua prudenza audace. Ispiri il nostro sinodo a rinnovare i cammini per la Chiesa in Amazonia, perché non si spenga il fuoco della missione. This prayer will continue throughout the entire month, as bishops have been encouraged to open their minds to new ideas and pathways that could emerge from the Synod. Two of these controversial issues include the role of women in the Amazon and also the idea of married men becoming priests so that they can also give the sacraments to areas where they're lacking. In Rome, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Back to you in New York, Emily. Melissa, today's opening ceremonies were on display to the world and meetings will continue for the next three weeks. Will those sessions be conducted in public? No, actually today's opening session will be one of the only ones that's open to the public and that was actually videoed. But don't worry, for the rest of these three weeks there will be a session at 1.30 in the afternoon where journalists can go and find out all the latest information with some members and participants who are inside the Senate Hall. This way we can report everything that's happening and everyone will know. Thank you, Melissa Butts, reporting from Rome. Stay with us for more comprehensive coverage of the Synod. Crux editor John Allen is also joining us from Rome. He's taking an up-close look at the biggest issues on the table, including married priests. That's still ahead in this newscast. The Pope's ambassador to the U.S. just made a special stop in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Archbishop Christophe Pierre celebrated a mass at St. Agnes Church in Carroll Gardens where, a sizable French, where there is a sizable French population. The Archbishop spoke about the Vatican summit and the importance of Catholics caring for creation. This is what the church should be. You know, the Christians should be like uh, looking at the future, the future of humanity, you know, the preservation of the environment is part of our mission. So this is what uh, the bishops will, will talk about it, and the Pope will listen to them. And uh, uh, I think uh, we should be happy to see that. The ambassador also said Pope Francis is a prophet for his Laudato Si encyclical on the care of creation. The Diocese of Bridgeport is receiving high marks from a former judge who investigated clerical sex abuse allegations in the Connecticut church. Bishop Frank Caggiano leads Bridgeport Catholics and he's being praised for major reforms that are now in place. I spoke with him about confronting the crisis. If you have a wound, you need to clean it out. You need to totally clean it out. And I think the judge has done a remarkable job transparently, completely, independently, objectively, to tell the story of what happened. Retired Superior Court Judge Robert Holzberg spent a year independently investigating what did and did not occur in the Bridgeport Diocese. And we'll be honest, 
Painting a difficult to hear picture of the past, saying prior bishops were more concerned with protecting the diocese than paying attention to abuse survivors. Judge Holzberg also painting a positive portrait of the present state of the diocese, finding only two cases of abuse have been documented in the 21st century, one in 2001 and the other in 2008. Also finding significant reforms are now in place, giving strong approval to Bishop Caggiano and his predecessor, Archbishop William Laurie for what they've done. Speaking with Currents News before celebrating a pro-life mass in Brooklyn, Bishop Caggiano said it was important to be transparent about the investigation in order to rebuild trust among the faithful. It has been overwhelmingly positive, recognizing it is painful. But part of the difficulty is if you tell the story in drips and drabs and pieces, you keep reliving, you keep taking the scab off, you keep re re opening the wound. Now the wound is really cleaned out. There really is nothing else to say of the past because there's nothing else that has not been looked at. The bishop says the judge's findings are allowing the diocese to look towards the future with one major goal still to be fully achieved. Those who survive abuse need to remain at the center of all of our efforts. G moving forward does not mean leaving them behind. They have to be at the forefront of everything we do. And please God, as they heal, the church will heal. Bishop Caggiano says looking forward means focusing on rebuilding the church and recommitting clergy to young people. Breaking news from Italy's Coast Guard about a migrant boat capsizing off the coast of Lampedusa, killing at least 13 women. Pope Francis visited the island on his first trip outside the Vatican in 2013. The latest tragedy occurred when the overcrowded boat hit heavy weather off Lampedusa's coast. The Coast Guard rescued 22 survivors but fear the death toll could go much higher. This is the latest disaster to hit migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean for Europe. Stay tuned for stories that you'll only find on Currents News. The justices are back to work today. High profile cases are on the docket and St. John's University expert Brian Brown is here to break them down. What Catholics need to watch out for. Married priests and women in the church, two of the biggest issues at the Amazon Synod. Crux's John Allen weighs in. The U.S. Supreme Court is back in business, beginning a new term this morning. The calendar is packed with cases that are of great interest to Catholics. John Lawrence has the story from Washington. The highest court in the nation has a number of high-profile cases on hand. They'll be talking about gun rights and LGBT rights, abortion and immigration. This will all happen as an impeachment investigation into President Trump takes place across the street in the Capitol building. All eyes will be on Chief Justice John Roberts. He's been trying to keep the court out of the political fray, but many of these cases will come down as the election gears up. And political tensions are already flaring. Dozens of protesters appeared outside Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's house Sunday, the anniversary of Justice Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation, calling for him to be removed. They are fearful that Brett Kavanaugh, who took the seat of Anthony Kennedy, is going to move the court to the right on some of those issues. Republican presidents have nominated five to the Supreme Court, including Justice Neil Gorsuch. Our job is just to make sure the law that you, that we, the people, have enacted through our Constitution or through our democratic processes, everyone gets the benefit of that law. The remaining four were nominated by Democratic presidents, including Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I love my job. It's the best and the hardest job that I have ever had. I'm John Lawrence reporting. As we just heard, the court is taking on some highly controversial cases, including the rights of the unborn, religious education, and immigration, all matters that are especially important to Catholics. This afternoon, I spoke to St. John's University political expert Brian Brown. Brian, let's talk about the case that pro-life advocates are watching very closely. The Louisiana law that regulates abortion is being challenged. This is the first abortion case before the court since President Trump appointed two conservative justices. What do you expect to happen? Well, let's see how this is argued in court. Um, the Louisiana law would require those who provide abortion services to have hospital privileges at a facility nearby. Um, this is similar to a law that was struck down in 2016 
uh, in Texas, but at that time the Supreme Court only had eight members because Justice Scalia had died and had not been replaced. Uh, this is an interesting case law. It's also be interesting, this is the first abortion law case we've seen with a full compliment and Justice Kavanaugh and Gorsuch uh, appointed by President Trump. So we'll see how the different sides work this big issue out. It's going to be very interesting. Now, another case the court will decide is whether Montana can exclude religious schools from a state scholarship program. A decision for the schools could provide much needed assistance for parents who want to send their kids to religious classrooms. How should that case go? Again, all these cases will be de depending how they're argued, and I, I don't know if I can handicap them, but that's an interesting case because a lot of states have some sort of voucher program. The case in Montana, parents wanted to apply to a, a private school. Uh, the state ended up getting rid of the program. Now they're looking at whether the establishment clause and the free exercise of religions was impacted by this program. And should government funds that are eligible to secular school also be applied to private schools. And now looking forward to tomorrow, the court will hear arguments on whether federal law protects gay and transgender people. What are your thoughts here? So this is an interesting case. The landmark civil rights uh, uh, law passed in 1964 did not define issues like gender identity and sexual orientation. So now the case, uh, the Supreme Court will examine this. Um, how will this impact private religious organizations? Will they still be allowed to apply their own deeply held religious beliefs within their own organizations when they're dealing with employee discrimination? These are big issues that the Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in on. And Will there be exemptions made, or how will this impact religious faith or, or organizations, whether it's a mosque, a synagogue, or a church? Tough decisions to be made. Very tough decisions. Now, really quick for me, next month the court will consider the fate of the nearly uh, 800,000 immigrants brought to the U.S. as children, also known as dreamers. Immigration is very important to the church. How do you expect the court to rule? This is another interesting uh, discussion of executive privilege. Uh, we know President Obama uh, passed DACA when he couldn't get it through Congress. He used the power of executive order, which many presidents do. President Trump is trying to rescind it. The courts have held up on that. But this is really a case about children who are born, you know, who the only country they know is the United States of America and how we deal with them. And, and we really need comprehensive immigration reform. And DACA and this decision might help us get there. Brian Brown of St. John's University, thank you so much for being here, and, and thank you for your insight. Appreciate it. Good to be here. A setback today for President Trump, who's trying to keep his tax return secret. A federal judge is tossing out Trump's arguments that presidents are immune from criminal investigations. Trump wants to prevent the Manhattan DA from getting the returns as part of a hush money probe. The president's lawyers immediately appealed the ruling and the appeals court agreed to temporarily block the judge's order. More now on our top story. The Senate is shaping up to be a contentious three weeks. Some of the biggest issues on the table, the environment, indigenous people, and married priests. Joining us now from Rome is the editor of Crux, John Allen. Hi, John. Hey, how you doing? Good, John. As the Holy Father launched the High Stakes Summit, he urged the participants not to kick the Holy Spirit out of the hall and also said that ideology is a dangerous weapon. What does he mean? Well, in, in, with reference to ideology, he was talking specifically about ideologies that he believes uh, give short shrift, that is, amount to disrespect for the native and indigenous cultures of places such as the Amazon. Uh, and he was calling the Senate to show respect for these people. He actually sort of put this in joking form. He talked about how yesterday somebody had complained that there was an indigenous person from the uh, Amazon wearing a feathered headdress inside the Vatican. And his, uh, his laugh line was, what's the difference between that and the Berettas that some of our cardinals wear? The more serious point is he wants this Senate to take a strong stand uh, in favor of ecological justice, in favor of the dignity and the rights, including the land rights of indigenous persons in the Amazon, uh, and also in favor of, of pastoral flexibility, of which this idea of the so-called very probati, or meaning tested mar uh, married priests, would be the leading example. Now, I think you're going to get pretty strong consensus around those ideas inside this Senate. Let's remember these bishops, the 184 bishops and run roughly 100 or, or so other participants, either come from the Amazon themselves or they have been handpicked for these roles by the Pope and his team. 
where you are not going to find such strong consensus is going to be outside the Senate, where these ideas are, fair to say, a good bit more controversial. And now, John, you just sort of touched on this, but the hotly contested issue of married priests is getting a lot of attention as the Senate begins. The idea is that well-respected married men could be ordained to help overcome the shortage of priests in remote areas of the Amazon. What do you think is going to happen uh, with this topic at the Synod? Well, one thing that is abundantly clear after today is that this issue is going to be front and center during the Senate debates. Uh, we heard this morning from Brazilian Cardinal Claudio Umes, who is the relatore, meaning roughly the chairman uh, of this Senate, appointed to that role uh, by Pope Francis and a key papal ally, uh, basically issue a ringing endorsement uh, of the very probati, saying that this is a request that is welling up from the communities of the Amazon, and it must be taken seriously by the, uh, by the Senate. Umas actually went further and said the conversation shouldn't just be about married male priests. It also ought to be about the role of women in church and ministries in the Amazon and the need to find a suitable ministry for those roles. John, another eagerly anticipated discussion will be concerning the role of women in religious sisters in the church. You just touched on that a bit, but really quickly, what sort of new ministries will the Synod Fathers consider creating for women? Well, you know, one live issue actually isn't about ministries in the Amazon, but it's about the role of women here in the Senate. There are 15 women religious nuns, to use the colloquial term, uh, who have been invited to be participants of this Senate representing uh, an international umbrella group of women religious. However, uh, they don't have voting rights. I suspect the focal point for that debate is going to be over the diaconate, the idea of female deacons. In 2016, Pope Francis created a commission to study that idea. The, its report, which was non-conclusive, has been sitting on his desk ever since. Uh, this Senate might be an opportunity for that debate to revive. John Allen, editor of Crux, thank you for being with us today, and we will touch base on the Senate again soon. Always an honor. For continuing coverage of the Synod that you won't find anywhere else, you can count on Currents News and the tablet. Be with us every night at 7 p.m. on Net TV and check in at thetablet.org. Also, the latest Synod developments will be posted on our Facebook and Twitter sites. Still to come on Currents News, they got their red hats and their first duty as new cardinals was a special visit. The advice they received from one of the wisest at the Vatican. And please check out one of the latest features in the tablet, the Our Diocesan Family page. That's where you can send in photos of your family receiving certain sacraments, such as baptism, first communion, confirmation, and marriage. For more information and to submit your pictures, go to thetablet.org slash Our Diocesan Family. We'll be right back. With Pope Francis leading the way, 13 new cardinals made a special visit to see Benedict XVI. The trip taking place not long after the prelates received their red hats. They each greeted the 92-year-old retired pontiff, and he told them to always be faithful to his successor. At the end of the get-together, both Francis and Benedict blessed the cardinals. Before we say goodbye tonight, we just want to wish someone a very happy birthday. Bishop Guy Sanserique turned 85 years old over the weekend. The retired auxiliary bishop is anything but. He spends each and every day continuing to minister, and we are so grateful to have him in our diocese. Happy birthday, Bishop Guy. That is Currents News. I'm Emily Druby. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.